filmed in New Jersey. Most of the actual story, most of it, happened in the New York docks, an area called Red Hook, although it did spill over to Jersey. In 1948, when the mob's presence, uh, Stranglehold, was found on New York, New Jersey piers, and it came to the national attention, those piers, New York, New Jersey, it was the busiest seaport in the world. It's all gone now. Every 15 minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this massive seagoing ships cleared the passages that were spread out through 750 miles of shoreline. It dotted 1,800 piers, 1,800 piers. 200 were so large, they served 400 ships at one time. Every year, 1 million passengers uh, departed from those waterfronts onto the luxury liners. 35 million tons of cargo passed in and out of the docks. The value then, in let's say 1948, was $8 billion. God knows what it would be today. The waterfront was home to 2,500 tugboats, barges, derricks, grouse. It was where 1,250,000 tons of fresh fruit arrived uh, to feed New York. A lot of that was carried, to be clear, uh, by 12 major railroads we had in this country then um, that were headquarters on these vast lots. So the waterfront in 1948 actually, from that angle, was a bastion of free enterprise. But then there's the other waterfront. It was poorer, much shabbier. It housed around 50,000 badly paid workers uh, in these rundown row houses. They had a name for them. It was crime infested. Uh, it was a closed little world that few people on the outside knew they ever saw. In South Brooklyn, Columbia Street was the boundary between the Italians and there. Most of the people who worked there were Italians and the Irish longshoremen. They were, you know, to an effect, there was two warring tribes, but uh, the people, if you see the film on the waterfront, they're, they're all Irish. Well, actually, all the victims were Italians. And a lot of those people were Ill illegal immigrants, and there wasn't a lot they could do about being taken advantage of by the mob. They shared this border of filthy water that was oily. Uh, the harbor bottom rose around several feet every year in this thick blanket of sludge and then to go back and it'd leave everything filthy. Um, sailors said that the guys who dredged this thing said if they wanted to bottle this stuff, they could sell it for poison or acid. Uh, the largest stock worker neighborhoods were Red Hook uh, in Brooklyn. Originally, it was a Dutch village called Rode Hook and the name just change. It was taken from the red clay that was there originally. In 1946, the Gowanus Expressway opened, and in 1950, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel uh, cut through the neighborhood. So it cut everything off, and it gave the Red Hook this otherworldly version. It was, it was, and, and uh, you know, King Al Capone grew up there, Lucky Luciano, and a lot more other guys who were mob guys who grew up there. In the early 1930s, the mafia boss on the waterfronts, New York, New Jersey, was this guy, Vincent Mangano, and his underboss, a treacherous guy named Albert Anastasia. In turn, Anastasia controlled for, for Mangano, controlled Emil Camrati, who was the vice president of the ILA, the International Longshoremen's Union, which has to be, was, and I think still might be, the most corrupt union we've ever had in this country. I mean, they looked, the Teamsters look like a joke. Camrati controlled this guy named Dr. Tom Longo, and Longo was a very political political power. He ran the City Democratic Club in that part of the world on 33 President Street. Uh, President Street, you might know, that's the gallows were. Camrati owned, by the way, the entire block. And that was just a two, three minute walk from Pier 11, which was the most corrupt pier there was. Uh, Longo was the mob and the ILA's contract to Edwin O'Dwyer, William O'Dwyer, rather, I'm sorry, the Brooklyn district attorney who was also corrupt. Mangano was the ultimate power, though. He was this old-style mafia guy, and his power within the ILA, the union, was just unquestioned, although he was virtually unknown outside that world. Uh, Vincent Manino, who was a lawyer who represented six ILA pistol unions, testified to the New York State Crime Commission that he was, quote, shocked to learn <laughs> that his position had been granted only after Mangano had said he could have the job. Nino Camrata, the brother of the ILA vice president, 
told him, of course it's true. Without Vincent Mangano's okay, nobody else could work here. Not you, not me. While Mangano was ruthless, he was not ruthless enough. In 1951, his underboss, Albert Anastasia, just got tired of having him around. He got tired of his old ways. He, he just, he wanted to take, so he murdered him. And then he took control of his entire organization, all 20 miles of the Brooklyn docks, aside from all his other operations outside the docks. It stretched from Pier 1, just below the Brooklyn Bridge, south to the end of the Bush Terminal, all the way to Hoboken, New Jersey. It's a long, it's a big piece of work. No one ever doubted that Albert, Albert Anastasia who they dubbed the Mad Hatter, was insane. How insane he was made clear one night in 1952. He's home, he's listening to the news on the radio, and he heard that the bank robber Willie Sutton had been recognized and turned in by a guy in Brooklyn. It's a young man, Albert Schuster, who, who meant no harm. He'd do what a good citizen should do. Anastasia gets out, out of his chair, he walks over to one of his guys, who's an escaped convict named Frederick Tentuno, and he says... Uh, I hate squealers. Find that fucking Schuster and kill him. And that's what he did on March 8th. Tatuna walked up behind Schuster, bang, bang, shot him in the head and killed him. When Sanity did return to Anastasia, he realized what he had done and he could go to jail for this. So he ordered Tenuto killed as well. Tenuto's body's never been found. Albert's long, spectacular criminal career started as a labor terrorist on the waterfront. He was once arrested. He stabbed and, st and strangled a dock worker named Joe Torino in a dispute over unloading cargoes. There were several witnesses. Daylight murder. Um, Anastasia was convicted. He sentenced to death. Spends 18 months uh, at the death house in Sing Sing. Just before he's get the, executed, he gets a new trial. The witnesses have all changed their statements, and the others have just disappeared. The state has no choice. They have to drop the charges. He walks out of prison a free man. Anastasia's enforcer on the Brooklyn docks was his brother, Tough Tony Anastasia, who was also the vice president, one of the vice presidents of the ILA, the union. Uh, and the boss of another local union, 1814, which he owned in the sense that it was his pocket, but it was a little piggy bank. He'd do whatever he wanted with it. He was on salary with the Jarka Stevedoring Corporation as an executive, a major employer on the waterfront. When Jarka's president, Frank Nolan, was pressed by state investigators to explain why this nearly illiterate Anastasia is on his payroll as a senior executive with these Harvard and Yale guys, he says, he is resourceful and tireless on a job. He preserves discipline and good order on part of the men. I think we all know what that means. He preserved discipline on all levels through fear. Uh, once when a reporter from the New York Sun, which was a great newspaper when it was around, had written an unflattering piece about uh, Albert Anastasia. Tony corners this guy and he says, uh, why do you keep writing these awful things, terrible things about my brother? He ain't killed nobody uh, from your family. Then he waited and said, yet. During World War II, Tony Anastasia claimed to have arranged for the sinking of the French luxury liner SS Normandy inside the New York Harbor as leverage uh, so that my boss, Lucky Luciano, could be released from Janamora State Prison, which is way in the hell up, almost near Canada. Uh, it's pretty airy up there, but wow, it's really far. Uh, they wanted Luciano put down closer to the city where in their brains he could run things from behind bars. So under pressure from naval intelligence, New York State relents and Luciano's released. The mob uh, stayed to the bargain uh, for the remainder of the war. And through their help, uh, there was never any Nazi infiltration on the New York harbors. Never. Nothing bad ever happened there from the bad guys, the Japanese, the Germans. Under Tough Tony's tutelage were these frontline enforcers. They were his lieutenants, a guy named Joe Adonis, who later became Joe Profaci, Tony Springs Romero. They were all members of the mafia who controlled heavy Italian locals um, of the ILA. One of the reasons the Hoods were able to run these locals uh, with this huge number of illegal aliens was, they again, they, they just never the illegals just wouldn't go and complain. They had a job, you know, it was relatively well-paying. It was all they could do. A lot of them couldn't speak English. They had no trade when they came here. Uh, one longshoreman said, if you have an all-Italian local and a lot of the men working there are young men who've jumped ship, 
may be illegal immigrants in many cases and very likely to do what they're told to do. On the Irish West Side, there was uh, Eddie Boy McGrath, uh, Edward J. McGrath, Eddie Boy McGrath. He'd risen through the ranks of the Irish mobs under little, little Oni Madden. Madden was a, a Welshman. He wasn't an Irishman. Officially, McGrath, he had a record for 12 arrests uh, for crimes raging, penny larceny, murder. He was, <laughs> of course, a salaried officer with the ILA. And he carried the title of organization, organizer at large, organizer at large, a position that he was appointed to by the Yale Superior President Joe Ryan. His actual duty on the front lines was political and police corruption and running a crew of thugs that included Johnny Cockeyed Dunn and Squint Sheridan, who controlled the numbers rackets across the, uh, the New York docks anyway. Dunn was the son of a merchant sailor who was lost at sea when Dunn was an infant. His mother remarried. Uh, her second husband is killed in a railroad accident. At age 15, Dunn is roaming the streets. He's part of this violent street gang. He's arrested at 16, robbing a hardware store with a gun. He's sent to a Catholic reform school. He's released at age 19. He walks out. He robs a grocery store of $625. He's arrested again. He's sent to a state reform school. He's released in 1931. So, you know, how many years of his youth are spent in prison? He's convicted a year later for robbing a poker game at gunpoint, and he's sent to Sing Sing, the worst place you can go. He was released less than a year due to the political pressures from Tammany Hall, uh, the political structure, the Democrat political structure in New York, uh, for Joe Ryan, his boss. Uh, Ryan put him under his brother-in-law, Eddie McGrath. In 1935, Dunn and McGrath were arrested on homicide charges, but were freed, lack of evidence, of course. And the more work Dunn did as McGrath enforcer, the better he was rewarded. In 1936, he was given an IL a charter for local 1346.1 to represent terminal checkers and platform workers. So basically, he just, he, he did nothing. He got paid. It was his. It was, again, his private bank. They gave him a charter, in fact, to form another local uh, for to cover the platform worker and the office workers uh, on the dock. Dunn's partner was Andy Sheridan, who, uh, who opened a sister local, 21512 in Hoboken. By 1938, Dunn is rich. He's bought this sprawling home in Kew Gardens in Queens. He's hired a full-time chauffeur for his wife. Vacations in Florida at a house he has down there. The house is owned by the local, but, uh, which, but he bought it. And so, forth. so Dunn, in 1942, decides he's going to make a play to control the hiring on Pier 51, which is this massive and very important dock on the waterfront. Now, hiring boss who ran things is a guy with a hood, Eddie Kelly. He holds out against Dunn, and he calls a strike against the pier until Dunn goes away. But it was a rigged election. Dunn follows Kelly into a season election. It's rigged. Uh, Kelly wins. Dunn walks into a saloon with him on West and 10th Street, beats him senseless. Kelly survived, yeah, and he pressed charges, which Dunn eventually was convicted for and sent to prison. But letters of support came in from Matt and Clayton Powell. Some of you are probably too young to remember who he was. He was a powerful New York City councilman uh, from Harlem. Uh, another letter came from George Tickham, a U.S. representative of Massachusetts, of all things, but, uh, and the heads of the U.S. Department. Transportation Department. The U.S. Army Transportation Corps also intervened, if you can believe this, and demanded Dunn's release as being vital to the war effort. Mayor LaGuardia, who was an honest guy, he's never a friend of the mob, called the Secretary of Defense and he demanded an explanation. None was given. The Army withdrew its request to free Dunn from prison. But in the end, Dunn only served two years of an eight-year term. He was released uh, September 16, 1944. He went back to work on the docks like nothing happened. So, Mob loan sharks were everywhere, and they were really powerful, that they were able to, de to demand the workers' pay card. You got a card so you, they knew who you were and pay you and so on. Uh, and that's how they'd, they'd take his pay card, and they'd go to the cashier, and they'd collect the money that was owed to them. Nobody could do anything. The sharks took out their percentage from the pay, which was cash, and the balance, if there was any, was given to the worker. Uh, a mob loan of $100. People were constantly broke, constantly taking loans. Well, uh, so they gave you $100. It cost $360. You see, it was $260 interest, and you had to pay that weekly. So November 1953, a ship carrying Hawaiian fruit 
canned fruit arrives on the piers that one of the piers that's directly owned by the Anastasia brothers. The local union there on that had broken off in the ALA and they switched to an AFL union. Uh, and they managed to convince the shipping line to hold off unloading the cargo for five days while they overthrew one of Anastasia's top lieutenants, this guy Anthony Calvo, called Spanish Tony. They needed to get him out of the local. Then they said, we'll get you there. It'll be an honest deal. So in the morning, the ship is to be unloaded. Anastasia gathers around 200 hoods. Uh, they got tire irons and so forth. Uh, the morning whistle blows. The rebels are vastly outnumbered. The guys who should be on the dock, vastly outnumbered. But they fought the gangsters uh, and threw a gauntlet to get to their jobs. Uh, they couldn't do it. They were beaten back, and uh, Anastasia won the day. But uh, the AFL, AFL wasn't above a fight either. So they gather 100 guys along Columbia Street, and they're marching towards the piers armed with baseball bats. So word of this impending battle and the cops arrive, 40 detectives, five motorcycle cops, 10 mounted police, 100 armed policemen, tear gas, and 25 members of the peer authority. There's a huge fight. Nobody knows who's fighting who. The cops are fighting both sides. Both sides are fighting each other. The cops did manage to push Anastasia's guys back from the pier and then let the AFL rebels who belonged on the pier go in and they gave him an escort in. Uh, they walked onto a plank to get into the pier. Anastasia's men tossed rocks and beer bottles at them as they went into the onto the pier. Um, in the end, they lost the pier. Um, Anastasia's brother, Gerardo, he had another brother called Bang Bang, uh, led another assault on the police lines. He was arrested. Tough Tony shows up telling the press that he would be back the next morning with, quote, 10,000 longshoremen to teach these punks to lay. He never showed up, of course. Eventually, uh, he they lost control of the piers uh, to the seafarers. Uh, but that, that's how it went for, for like two decades, you know. So uh, as it happened in 1956, little had changed on the waterfront. The mob ran the ILA, Tough Tony Anastasia, his guys would punch, shoot, kill, stab, whatever, to control the waterfronts in Brooklyn. Uh, Mickey Bowers' mob was still a power along the piers over in New York. Uh, his loan sharkers were running things. Anastasia eventually, Albert Anastasia, uh, fell from power because of this complicated plot, counterplot, mafia thing he did. October 25, 1957, Probably the Gallo brothers, who knows, who knows uh, working on orders from the National Mafia Commission. They kill Anastasia when he's sitting in a barber chair at the Sheridan Hotel with a hot towel wrapped around his face. There were 11 people in this tiny shop. The shop is still there. It's no longer a barber shop. The room is still there. Five barbers, a manicures, three shoeshine boys, and two customers. They watched the entire thing happen, and they shot him 10 times uh, into his head and neck. But nobody saw nothing. They don't know nothing about nothing. In 1962, a year before Tough Tony died, his brother died, he told the FBI that his brother deserved to die. He said, I ate from the same plate. I ate from the same table. We both came from the same womb. But my brother deserved to die. He killed too many men. <laughs>